Hello, and welcome to the March issue of NTV. We're on the set here in the Corporate Communications Division at Seattle City Light. I'm Sharon Bennett. And I'm Jalen Smith. It's a common sight on Capitol Hill and in other areas of the city to see utility poles covered with posters and signs. And the issue has been in the news again for City Light as safety and freedom of speech came face to face or pole to pole. Should pole signs be freely allowed or banned? The story's been told before, but this time many City Light workers' voices were heard. One was Jeff Kasha, who wrote an editorial opinion in the Seattle Times expressing worker safety. Well, I don't think most people think about putting litter on poles and the people that have to climb through it. When I see somebody putting a sign or attaching something to a pole, I usually go up and try to explain to them why we don't want things attached to poles. People don't think about me climbing through this and having to worry about me falling off a pole because they put something on it. But there's a real hazard and it becomes a real safety issue when you're climbing through it. I personally, I've gapped, I caught my wrist on a nail coming down. I got hung up. I had to climb up the pole to get unattached. I know people that have cut out and fallen. I've seen people with splinters in their arms and cheeks from hitting the pole, and it's all from pole litter. Our clothing gets torn up, our gloves, our shirts, our jackets, and it makes a hazard that we just don't need. The city council approved legislation to ban handbills and signs and hold violators accountable through affiliations with a business, address, or phone number on the bill. The ordinance goes into effect in early June, giving time for neighborhoods to develop community notice boards. During the cold winter months, water conditions remain a hot topic for City Light. As we head in the spring, we've had our share of showers here in Seattle. But Jay, that doesn't mean we have surplus water where we need it to generate power. The watersheds and areas that collect water needed to power our Skagit and Boundary projects are quite far from the ski areas. Wholesale Deputy Superintendent Ted Coates says lack of early precipitation affects our ability to sell surplus power and create revenue we rely upon when rates are set. There is literally no way that we feel that we can uh, receive revenues of the initial 25 million that we had planned on when we set our rates last year. So that's basically the problem. We don't have an operational problem. We are going to be able to meet our customers' demands. It really translates into a financial issue. We make purchases to keep our reservoir levels up here at the Skagit because there hasn't been the accum accumulated uh, snow that we would like to have had by this time. When we have that information ahead of time from snow surveys, that gives us the confidence to go ahead and make those sales, you know, in that first part of the year. We don't have that confidence. We have been making sales. We've been making a few what we call prudent purchases to keep our reservoir levels up, and that means that we're going to be able to meet customer demand. So it becomes a revenue problem. Yes, it's raining here in Seattle, but we've got a problem over here. The March snow survey results are still being evaluated. We'll keep you posted each month on NTV. While safety on poles comes into clear focus for our customers, safety around our lines is always an urgent issue in the utility business. For contractors, getting the job done on time and under budget may be the first consideration. But all too often, workers come into contact with city light equipment with serious implications. Mike Thompson of Environment, Health, and Safety recently spoke to a group of industry professionals about this issue. These representatives took the message back to their companies, and one of them talked with us about City Light's involvement in spreading the safety message. Uh, the avenue was opened up to me to call either Mike Thompson or somebody else within City Light to uh, know that I can ask them a question as to what can I do to deal with this situation to protect our people. Even though it may not be City Light Lines, they've, Mike's been very good about answering questions and helping me to understand the technology that I need to have to uh, provide a safe workplace for our people. Last month, we heard about moves taking place in and around the City Light building. While movement continues, the possibility of a real earth shaker here in Seattle and the continued cost of upkeep on the City Light building mean downtown employees may be on the move again as early as 1995 perhaps into a leased downtown space until a permanent home bringing all city offices together can be built. It's very similar to when you're driving an old car. 
you have to make a determination, do I invest more in replacing the motor or is it time now to buy a new one? And that's really the analysis that's being done at this point. We have a, a very good group working at City Light to evaluate all the alternatives that we have. And that group is headed by Jane Nishida, and she has help from uh, people in finance and people in facilities. And they're working very closely with, uh, with the rest of the city and the city DAS consultants to determine what really are the alternatives out there. And from what I understand right now is a very, very good time to be looking at real estate in Seattle. And we're in a situation where the, um, the prices are rather low and there's good availability. And if we're going to do it, from what I understand, we need to, um, to go through the evaluation process rather quickly and really figure out if this is what's best for City Light and for our customers. Information gathering is on a fast track about the best available space for the utility. We'll keep you posted with more information as it's updated. It's the time of year when many of us are planning summer vacations. But City Light's Greg Carlson spent his vacation time as a volunteer in the Philippines, using skills from his City Light job like excavating and wiring to help build a community school and church. I'm just hoping to go down and leave something there, you know, meet some people, make some friends, and uh, leave something of myself there, some work, you know, do some work. It's all volunteer. I'm really excited about it. We'll be checking back with Greg for an update. Sharon, you know the executive team that leads City Light is now one step closer to being complete. Right, Jay. The permanent appointment of a director for strategic technology and planning was announced last month. Norm Allberg was selected through the Employee Involvement Panel Process, which requires commitment from the panel members as well as the candidates. The price to pay for the thoroughness of the process is the time it takes. And while um, these are important decisions, all hiring decisions are long-term decisions, so it's probably worth some upfront effort. Uh, I would venture to say I was on an interview panel myself for the wholesale deputy and it takes much more time and is and is a lot of work for the interview panel also that I think more so than anybody anticipates uh, up front that I'll show up ask a few questions and leave no it takes mental rigor on the one side of the table asking the questions and making sure you're being real thorough albeit I've been on both sides of the table and it is much easier to be on the side of the table asking questions than be on the side of the table answering them but it isn't easy it's it's a very important decision and comes with a lot of responsibility so it it is a long-term investment that we're making by taking I think it actually extends our hiring process um, by virtue of the, the involvement and the extensiveness of employee input but I think you get better decisions in the in the long term for the employees Norm is the director of the division that leads the charge for the upcoming strategic corporate plan the utility is developing. City Light has sought input from customers like the University of Washington, Boeing, and others, and employees for a stakeholder process. The point we're at right now in the corporate plan is we've identified with some sort of consensus there are a lot of strengths and weaknesses, threats and opportunities what do we need to do, particularly in our 95-96 budget, but maybe there's some short-term, near-term things that we can do in 94 to position ourselves. So that's the point we're at right now is getting input from the stakeholders, uh, all the directors and managers, and they'll be involved in their employees. Here are the um, a consensus of strengths and weaknesses, threats and opportunities that are facing us. What do we need to do over the next couple of years to position ourselves to be successful in the future? It's, it's a very exciting time to be in the utility business and I'm looking forward to the plan having a tangible impact on the operation of the utility. It, it o doesn't do us any good to put together a gorgeous plan with good graphics and have it sit on people's shelf we have every intention of having this plan be a living document to have it operationalized and our hope is the executive team wants every employee to know how their job supports the strategic direction of the utility so that you will see a lot of information in the future about the strategic direction and people will through this budget process know how their division and their work on an individual level supports the strategic direction of the utility it's it's going to be a very different plan than you've seen before 
Preparing for the future involves the whole utility, and the engineering division is working on an ambitious planning strategy. It's called Engineering 2000, and Tui Trung from Engineering's Project Management Unit joins us to report on that story. CityLight's 180 members engineering division keeps the utility hardware operating while constantly improving old designs like the rebuild of the historic incline lift to meeting tomorrow's demands of power with the South Folk Toll Hydro Project. Engineering always face new challenges. Engineering 2000 is a seven-phase project to review services provided by the division and determine the best course for the future. As technology changes, uh, we find that we're doing our jobs different than we have in the past. And also, uh, with the talk of competition, we realize that we need to do our jobs more efficiently also. And as we, uh, uh, we sat around and talked about uh, the direction that engineering uh, ought to be going, uh, we found that many times uh, we're in somewhat of a reactive mode and perhaps don't really always provide our customers the best services that uh, we can for a variety of reasons. And uh, in addressing those problems uh, and figuring out how to, uh, to approach those concerns, the leadership in the engineering division uh, uh, felt that it was a good time to take a look at how we provide engineering products and services and, uh, and to answer some basic questions. Uh, uh, how well do we do uh, what we're doing? How important is that to our customers? Uh, are there some things that, uh, that we should be doing that we're not doing? Are there some things that we ought to be uh, preparing ourselves to do in the future? And uh, in an attempt to figure out how to answer those questions and how to uh, perhaps organize for the next century, we came up with a, a process that we call Engineering 2000. The newly completed System Control Center here is one of engineering's many capital improvement projects that will provide efficient service well into the 21st century. Employee input has been critical in evaluating our services, planning workloads, and determining the division's future. Uh, early on in developing the concept for Engineering 2000, we recognized that uh, employee involvement would be uh, essential. And as a part of uh, our process, we formed an Engineering 2000 Employee Advisory Committee, which has met some eight or nine times uh, to date uh, and has provided some invaluable assistance and advice and help to uh, the Engineering Division leadership as we have gotten Engineering 2000 underway. The Engineering 2000 project should be implemented in 1995, and progress report will appear on NTV. For Engineering 2000, I'm Thuy Truong. By the year 2000, it's very likely electricity will power thousands of vehicles. This could be the source for added utility income and require resource planning. Down in Southern California, large companies are faced with putting their fleets on the road without emissions in the near future. Southern California Edison is on the way to meeting that goal with their fleet of electric cars. Bearing the smog-free license plates, they show off the benefits of a clean, efficient motor pool to their customers in the community. While many of us are planning this month and getting our yards in shape, elementary school children went to work planting seeds for trees that may eventually find homes under power lines. As part of Tremendous Seattle and the city's urban reforestation plan. Planting the right tree in the right place is also an investment in the future. And speaking of the future, we've got many more NTV stories already in the works for the upcoming month. But give me a call at 684-3008 if you've got a story we can use for NTV. From the news desk in corporate communications, I'm Jalen Smith. And I'm Sharon Bennett for Network on Television. See you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.